there's a lot of things that we Christians talk about and believe. And then there's in church, out of church. Then there's some things that stand out, or they're, they, they're, they stand out to me anyway. And it's, I am so appreciative that the Lord brought to my consciousness the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. He does not depend upon what I think or do or anybody else. God is sovereign. And in His sovereignty, He called us. It was not our choice to call Him. He said to His disciples, I, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you. And I didn't necessarily grow up with that concept. I grew up with the concept of it's your decision. Well, I'm also thankful that God revealed unto us the total depravity of man. You believe that? Amen. Within me, there is no good thing. And Paul told the Romans in his letter, he says, there is none righteous. And then he adds, no, not one. In other words, he wanted to emphasize you're not righteous, and you're not righteous. You know, none of us are righteous within ourselves. And another thing is that we don't have to be perfect to be a Christian. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And you know this phrase that we use, lose your temper? Have you ever lost your temper? I'm looking around. Have you ever lost? Well, did you find it? Yeah, you, you found it. Um, That's our worst sin. It's not stealing candy bars from Walmart. It's not stealing cars. It's not deliberately hurting somebody else. It's usually that organ just below our nose. You know what I mean? Uh, saying things that's not right or hurtful to other people. But the Lord forgives, and I hope the other person does too. I'm thankful that the Lord revealed unto me who I am, that I'm a child of Abraham. I really, really appreciate that. I was not taught that in church. But God revealed it to me in a supernatural way when I was 17 years old. I didn't know what to do with it. But um, later on, you know, the Lord added to it. But I am extremely, extremely thankful that God revealed that to me. And it just goes right along with another point, And that's election. Do you believe in election? I think it's in the book. And I was reading an, reading an article not too long ago and somebody commenting on it. You mean God predestines things? Yes, He does. He does. 
So here in this congregation, we can rejoice that we believe in the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over all things, the universe. And his salvation is a gift. It's not earned. It's not earned. And in that gift, there's continual forgiveness. So forgive other people. You forgive other people? Forgive them. Even your, even your husband or your wife. <laughs> For, forgive them. Because there's where your greatest offense will come from your own family members. Jesus said that. So we approach the Bible as God's word. Yes. Not that we understand it all. But we accept it all. We accept it. We don't understand all of it. Because going along with our first Two lessons in this subject, in this series, Isaiah 55, our text, he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your, your ways my ways, for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The Lord reveals himself, as I see it in the Bible, the Lord has revealed himself through his name, his word, and his spirit. His name, his word, and his spirit. Now, there's a fourth way, and that's through angels. But how often have I communicated with an angel? Amen. How often has an angel appeared to you and told you something? I've never had an angelic visitation. But we see it in the Bible. That would be a fourth way. Yeah. But the Lord reveals his nature through his name. He reveals his plan through his word. And he reveals his actions through his spirit. He reveals his nature through his name. Now, you know, there's a big argument concerning the sacred names of God. And I have no contention with anyone that... that uses the sacred name, what they call the sacred names, such as Yahweh or Yahshua. I have no contention with that. Though usually those that use those names excuse, exclusively have a problem with us who don't use them exclusively. <laughs> usually that's the way it works. Yeah. But accepting the fact that YHVH, the Tetragrammaton, is correct, and some people would even scold me for putting it that way, but I accept it. Um, when I was in, oh, I guess, theology class in college, uh, the professor, Dr. Stanley M. Horton, he was a brilliant man. He could read and write Hebrew and Greek. He was a member of the Jerusalem um, society over there where they go and they excavate and dig in the dirt and find all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, so he was a very brilliant man. And he told us, he said, at least once a week, I get offers from Yale and Harvard and other universities to come and teach there. Because he had several degrees. But this is what he said. He said, as far as we know, the sacred name is YHVH. Mm -hmm. 
as far as we know. So, uh, I accepted that as there's that slim possibility that there is a, another name of the Almighty that is yet unknown. Yeah. Or it was known at one time in ancient history. Um, because he showed us a picture of some carving in a stone of YHVH. Well, how old is that carving? How old is that stone? He didn't say. Uh, but, you know, the Lord has revealed himself through different names through Scripture. So, we're all familiar with this. Um, some people repudiate strongly the name Jehovah. Um, they just, some people despise it. They say it's a total pagan name. Well, um, I don't pride myself in being a linguist, so therefore I'm going to leave that up to somebody else. They may be correct, uh, but yet some people despise the name of Jesus. They absolutely despise it. Christian people. Uh, possibly you've, you've met them. Um, a woman told me one time, she came up to me directly after the sermon was over, and she said, every time you use the name Jesus, I just cringe. Um, well, I don't feel that way. I kept on using it. Let her cringe. Uh, but there's been some mighty works of God done through and in the name of Jesus Christ. Mighty works of God. And I've been in meetings of preachers that probably didn't even graduate from the eighth grade. And God was with them. And they used the name Jesus. And things were done. People were healed. People were saved. Uh, some people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all in the name of Jesus. So was the Lord just honoring us in spite of our ignorance? I don't know. Uh, they say it's a pagan name. But... I'm not going to accept it as a pagan name. I'm going to accept it as an anglicized name. Amen. As an anglicized name yes. of his ancient name, whatever that was. Yahshua. And there's about six different pronunciations of that, and I don't know which one to use. Yes. Other than just Yahshua. Mm -hmm. And I have been, I shouldn't say this, but I have been strongly reprimanded by some people, by some Yahwehists, because I didn't pronounce the name Yahweh right. So, <laughs> I couldn't win for losing. Uh, one woman told me, you don't even supposed to say it, you just, that's it. So, come on, I'm, I'm confused here. You know, God in His name, He's trying to reveal not a pronunciation, but his nature. Yes. That's the way I look at it. And forgive me, folks, if I cross the line with, with some of your teaching. I didn't mean to offend anybody. Uh, but some people uh, have convictions there, and I honor your conviction. But I want to read you a list, and it's a list that we all know. You know, God began to reveal his name unto Jacob. I want to go there first. In, in Genesis 28 and verse number 13, Jacob, well, he left home. He stopped at Bethel. He had this dream of the ladder set up 
and angels ascending and descending. And in Genesis 28, 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Jacob. And he stopped right there. Well, Abraham and Isaac, when, he, when the Lord said, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac, he was talking about the revelation of covenant that God gave Abraham and confirmed it in Isaac. Because Abraham himself was not perfect. But it was the revelation of truth that God gave to that man. I will make a covenant with you. So God was honoring not just the man Abraham, because he made some goofs. He was not honoring just the man, the person of Abraham. He was honoring the vow that he had made to Abraham. So therefore he said, I am the God. He could have said it this way. I am the Lord God of the covenant of Abraham. I am the Lord God of the covenant that I confirmed in Isaac. So he was cons confirming the fact that he will keep the Abrahamic covenant. You follow me? He was revealing his nature because Abraham is not our Savior. But the covenant that God made with Abraham the source was God himself, and he obligated himself to keep that because it was a unilateral covenant and not a bilateral covenant. The, the Mosaic covenant was bilateral. One party breaks the covenant, then the covenant is broken on the part. The, the other faithful party is not obligated to keep his part. But when God made a covenant with Abraham, he said, I will keep this for a thousand generations. And if a, thousand, if a generation is 40 years, that's 40,000 years. So the Abrahamic covenant is still in existence. So God revealed himself to Jacob and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. Now, when the Lord revealed himself to Moses, let's go to Exodus chapter 3. When he revealed himself to Moses, In Exodus chapter 3, Moses saw the burning bush. We'll start at verse number 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. How do you think Moses felt? I am that I am. <laughs> I never heard this one before. <laughs> I am that I am. And then he explains it further. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, moreover unto Moses, now I'm going to, this is my imagination. Maybe Moses had a puzzled look on his face. <laughs> I am that I am. Never heard that before. And Moses, and God said unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and now he adds the God of Jacob. Now he's, he's telling Moses, I'll keep 
the, the promises that I gave to Abraham, confirmed in Isaac, and now I'm adding all the promises that I gave to Jacob. And we can read them. And Jacob included the 12 boys, his 12 sons. So when we read Genesis 48 and 49 and Deuteronomy 32 and 33, we add all that together. And God is saying, I'm going to keep every bit, all of that, everything that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. You can, I used to use the phrase, you can take it to the bank, but I don't like that phrase anymore. Because some of these banks fail. But you, you, you get my point. You can stand on it. You can rest on it. You can be assured that God said to Moses, you go tell the children of Israel that everything that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to bring it to pass. So he's revealing his nature through his name. I am that I am. It appears to me that that is always in present tense. Wouldn't you say? Amen. Always, whether it be yesterday, today, or tomorrow. It's always present tense. I am the same yesterday, today, and I'll be the same for you, Israel, tomorrow, because I am that I am. And it also, to me, implies self-existence. You know, I've entitled this series, For His Great Namesake. He is revealing His name. He is revealing His nature. And everything that He promised is in His name when he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's not only physical or material blessings there, there's spiritual blessings, there's salvation, because the gospel was actually preached in the Old Testament to Abraham. Well, Jesus came along and said, I am seven different times in the book of John. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am life. I am the way. I am truth. So it's, this name is personified in a person. Now, this list. In Genesis 28, Abraham has the knife in his hand. He's ready to slay his son. And then there was a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. And instead of slaying Isaac, Abraham slew the ram. That was a provision of God. So he was the Lord our provider. But before you can provide, you have to precede the need. If you see somebody, before you can provide them a meal, you have to know something. You have to be able to see. They're hungry. They need something to eat. So it's precede and provide. So, I'll read them this way. Adonai, the Lord our sovereign master. Yahweh Jara, the Lord will provide. Yahweh Nissi, the Lord our banner. Yahweh Rofeka, the Lord our healer. 
Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace. Yahweh Sid Canoe, the Lord our righteousness. Yahweh M. Kadeshim, the Lord our sanctifier. Yahweh Sabiot, the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. Yahweh Shema, the Lord is present. Yahweh Elion, the Lord Most High. Yahweh Rohai, the Lord our shepherd. Yahweh Hosanu, the Lord our maker. Yahweh Elohim, the Lord our God. So the Lord has chosen to reveal himself in several different capacities. And he told Israel one time, he said, just call me jealous. My name is jealous. And then in Exodus 20, well, um, let me read it. In Exodus 20, and verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, idols, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. He actually revealed one of his attributes. He says, I am jealous. And then later on, in chapter 34, he said, my name is jealous. Yes. So he desired his people to Israel, you belong to me, you worship me and me only. I am jealous. Yes. Now, there's a lot of scriptures that I could read. I'm only just going to read a few. In 2 Kings chapter 19, verse number 34, 1934. The Lord is talking about, or this context is concerning the Assyrian captivity of Jer ancient Jerusalem. And the Lord said, for I will defend this city to save it. He didn't say for Israel's sake. He said for my name's sake. See, this is part of the sovereignty of God. He's protecting his own reputation. He told David, I'm going to put my name in that city. Now, later on, it left. But he says, I'm going to protect this city because I said I would do it for my name's sake. In Isaiah, four, Isaiah 7, very familiar scripture, Isaiah chapter 7. You know, we say a lot of things, I know I say a lot of things, but really the focal point is a person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when in the Old Testament he is revealing himself to his people through the prophet Isaiah, he gave himself a name, another name. And that was the name of his manifestation of himself in flesh. And he says, therefore the Lord himself is going to give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and you're going to call him Emmanuel, God with us. So let's, let's try to focus in on something right here this morning. When the promise was given 700 years before the birth of Christ, he says, when this child is born, when this son is manifested, look at him and say, this 
is God with us. How much of God? One third? A hundred percent. Because as I mentioned before, one of the attributes of God is indivisibility. You cannot divide him up. So if Jesus were standing right here, say, God with us. Say, oh, well, that's, no, he's God number two. No, you can't do that. He revealed himself in a name, Emmanuel. And he also did it to Joseph, Matthew chapter 1. When the angel appeared to Joseph, Mary is going to bring forth a son. And he's already named. Joseph, you don't have to look in the name book to find a name. I'm na I have already named him. God named him. His father named him. Now, Hebrews 1 4. Kind of taking the shortcut here. Hebrews 1 4. Being so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. I want to read on. Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, what is that more excellent name? Son. But as many as believed on him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. Angels were not begotten. They were created. But the writer here is telling us that the Son was begotten. So what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? Ye must be born or begotten of God. I'm not making us equal with Jesus. But we, if a person is truly born again, he has a sonship status. You see, he brought us out of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Son is a name and also a title. So we may act like rascals. <laughs> Some of your children may act like little imps. <laughs> but they're still your son and your daughter. So God has highly exalted, the Father highly exalted Jesus Christ. And it says, He hath obtained a more excellent by inheritance. Well, Sons inherit the possessions of the Father. 
And I don't want to get sidetracked, but Paul talked about the body, the body of Christ, and Christ as the head. If you see a head with no body, something is wrong. Or if you see a body with no head, something is wrong. So we have been brought into a position or a status of sonship to make up the body, but we're not the head. Christ is the head. You may be a little finger, but the body would be incomplete without that little finger. So as the, as the son, it's a corporate body. You follow me? Yeah. It's a corporate body. The record tells us in Hebrews, in bringing forth sons to glory, plural, and we obtain this also by inheritance, because we have, not arrogantly, but we have the right because of the pattern son. He paid the price. He opened the door. He brought us in. We can't go in on our own. Well, let me read one other verse concerning the name. Didn't mean to spend this much time on the name. But anyway, in Revelation 19, There's just so much about the name that we could spend hours. Revelation 19. The context is the coming of the Lord in glory and splendor. Verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That's another name. Faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge. And he makes the war. He can start it. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. And he had a name written. No man knew no man knew, but he himself. I take this to say that there is a name of Jesus Christ yet unrevealed. When he comes, he's going to have a name that no man knows, but he himself. So when we get real sticky about the name and the pronunciation, you may not be totally, completely correct. Because there's a name yet unrevealed to everyone. But this is a name that is in relationship to war. You notice that? Yes. He's coming to make war, to judge. And he's coming on this white horse, symbolically. And he's coming to make war, and there's this war name that he has that is yet unrevealed. But boy, what a day when he does reveal it, 
and begins to roll up his sleeve, so to speak, and draw out his sword and make war with the nations. I mean, that's going to be a wash day. Verse number 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. See, we know that name. So the Word of God is a name, but it's not, it's not the name that's hidden. Because we don't know it. So there's things in the mystery of God, in the mind of the Almighty, that has never yet been revealed. Not only this, I'm convinced that there's many other things that we do not know. You could have the alphabet behind your name. Doctor of this and so forth. And you're not even scratching the surface of divine knowledge. Because he reveals his name. Lord, reveal yourself unto me by whatever name you choose. If I need provision, you'll be the provider. If I need salvation, he's the Savior. Lord, reveal your nature. And if you want to come up with a, a totally different pronunciation, that's fine with me. But I know one thing, one name covers it all. I am that I am. That's the name that he gave to Moses. And he said, when you go down to Egypt, that's the name that I'm going to deliver my people by. I am that I am. Well, he's called the Word of God. In the beginning was what, John said? The Word. In the beginning was, folks, this is bigger than our little cavity up here. It's bigger. I mean, this, uh, some lady called up the other day and she, she was thrilled. And she kept going on and on expressing her appreciation, mainly for one thing. She said, when you taught on your tapes the self-revelation of God, God reveals Himself at and by and through His own discretion. Genesis 12, Abraham was living in a pagan land and God appeared to him. You think Jacob ate too many beans the night before and had this dream? No, it was a self-revelation of God. Same with Moses. And he always comes and reveals his nature. And I pray that everyone understood, here and elsewhere, understood my comments concerning the, quote, sacred names. But what I have experienced in my life, what the Lord has revealed to me, He's never given me another pronunciation of a name. But yet, he has revealed himself to me many times and in many different ways. And it was always focused in on I am. I am. 
I am this, that, and so forth. So, what's in a name? Everything's in a name. I wish I knew the perfect name that Abraham used. But I don't. I don't. And I seriously doubt if anyone else does. I wish I knew the actual pronunciation of the name that Adam used. But I don't. But we know that God revealed himself to Adam. So therefore, I admit my frailty, my weakness. Therefore, I recognize I fall short in knowledge to know for sure what the pronunciation of his name is. But we know one thing, that if you look at the Son, S-O-N, if you look at Emmanuel, God with us, you may not have the perfect first century pronunciation, but you can find and see his nature. It's in his name. <coughs> Inheritance is in his name. Election is in his name. Predestination, sovereignty is in his name. Salvation, healing, provision, etc. It's in his name. Because it's in his person. And one other point. Going back to Hebrews 1, verse 4, 5, and 6. Are we a son of God? Are you a son? Are you a son? But we're not called Jesus. We're not called the Christ. But we come under that name and that title of son. S-O-N. And you know, there's no, we've heard this all of our life, there's no greater word in the English language than mother. You know. Or father. The prodigal son, son said, I'm going to go back to my father's house. We don't know the father's name. But it was relationship. That's what it all boils down to, is relationship. I'm the son. He's my father. Hallelujah. There's more, but I'm going to stop there. Thank <laughs> you.